Can I sit here? Is this going to mess anything up if I sit? Because it feels weird to sit back there. Um, thanks so much for being here. Um, my name is Todd Chandler. I made Flood Tide along with a lot of help from a lot of people. Um, so thank you all for being here, for watching. And thanks to the Brooklyn Museum for having us. Um, Marshall LeCount, who has been a you know, collaborator in starting in this film and being in Dark, Dark, Dark and making the music and helping to organize this amazing event tonight. He's going to get up a little later and lead us into the next stage of this event. <clears throat> but first, we're just going to have a few minutes. I'm going to say a couple of things about the film, and then we're going to bring up um, Caledonia Curry. Um, this one right there. to talk a little bit um, about the sort of broader network of collaborations that um, have grown out of the, sort of what we'll call it the, the raft community. Um, so I'll just say a couple things real quick, and it has to be quick because I have about a 5% battery here and just a couple of notes. So it's going to die and then we're going to move on. Um, so I, this, is, this is the New York premiere of this. I'm really super, super extra psyched to be here. Um, it's been a long road and I have, you know, done up some screenings elsewhere and I've been asked, um, you know, why, why didn't you just make a documentary? Which is a good question, you know, it's a fair question. For me, um, you know, I've been involved in these projects for several years, right? The first raft project that this community was involved in was in 2006 called the Miss Rockaway Armada and that was a very collective project. We went down the Mississippi and took us about three months to go 250 miles. Um, and then the next summer that project continued and then two, the two summers after that, 2008 and 2009, those were more sort of Cali authored projects, but you know, the same community of collaborators. Those were, that was on the Hudson River which, on which this was shot and then um, on the Adriatic Sea kind of crashing the Venice Biennale. Um, and so ha having spent a few years on this project, for me what was really interesting was just the, that there was no singular narrative. Right? It was just a project that was full of contradictions and full of um, problems and questions and beauty and there were just so many things that for me somehow it made more sense to make something that had its own narrative and its own life that could be in conversation with the project and maybe even in, in contradiction to it sometimes. Um, and so, you know, some of the stuff in there is pulled from interviews with people, you know, it, it took me two months to get my personality back to use that trip, for example, or some people did um, go to learn how to fix motors or learn how to pilot a boat, right? And people did give us tomatoes from their gardens, and sometimes people thought we were going to rob them, and sometimes people asked us if we had orgies on them. But, you know, there were all these different perceptions from people who were interacting with us and also from people who were, um, us, who were, we were, everyone was experiencing it in a different way, everyone was there for a very different reason, so for me it sort of made sense to sort of explore that in some way, and for me, um, one of the big motivations was that I, I had never really worked in a big community, you know, I'd been in bands, but kind of shied away from any sort of scene or large group, it freaked me out, so, you know, jumping on board a, a you know, 110 foot barge made of trash with about 50 other crazy people and spending several months on it was like, that was a, that was a test for me. It was challenging, it was frustrating, and um, it was also really exciting. And what was most exciting was to really experience the power of this group of people to create something totally amazing. Um, and that sort of continues, right? There's been, there's this really kind of extended family of raft folks who have been making amazing work together and that work has, you know, has a lot of connections to these original projects in spirit or energetically or sometimes in process. Um, and so part of tonight is about sharing that work in some way, right? We call it submerged collaborations because this sort of collaborative network is a really interesting one. Um, it doesn't really fit squarely into any category. It's not really an art collective. Um, there's group decision making, but it's not like activist stock consensus. Um, and it's not really studio artists with assistance. Um, it, you need a big community to make something this big. Um, so it's an interesting model that's sometimes hard to pin down, and it's sort of invisible in a way, right? It's like this invisible extended network that, um, you know, that sometimes those of us who are part of it don't even recognize it in some way. So tonight we kind of wanted to shed a little bit of light on that and talk about that um, a bit more. So um, let me see if there's anything else about that. Right, so that isn't just about flood tide, and it's not just about this, this submerged motherland orchestra, which is this great ad hoc 
group of group music group that's going to be performing music in Cali's installation later. It's about this larger kind of network in a way. So um, one way to start exploring that or to take a first stab at it was to um, try to figure out a way to map it. So I'm going to try to bring this up and see if it works. Let's see. Maybe. Maybe not. Not there. And there. Okay. That's showing up? Yes. Okay. So this is a, an incomplete first attempt at a kind of map. And um, basically just sent out an email to all the lists, the project lists, and to some individuals too, and said, you know, here are some criteria. You know, give, you know, give me any projects that you know that are somehow connected in spirit to the RAF projects, that, you know, that are collaborative, that happen after the RAF projects, that are related either, you know, aesthetically or process-wise, or you know, there are a number of criteria. It was amazing, like over 60 projects, and it's like very, very incomplete, right? But all these projects came in, and there were a lot of surprises in there, things that I never imagined were connected or things that I didn't know about. Um, so we're going to sort of explore this a little bit, and Callie's going to come up and talk about the power of working in this way. Here's Callie going to So thanks to everyone who made it. I'm sorry I heard there are some folks that couldn't get in, um, but this is a really great evening. And so, you know, I we were inspired to create this evening for a lot of different reasons. And one of them is just because, you know, you come here to the museum, you go to the fifth floor, you see that there's this installation created by this one person. Yeah, right. And like it's just one of those things where there you get into situations with art making where you get into authorship and maybe a person kind of has a, a vision and really wants to execute it and is very specific about that. And even in that seemingly clear cut of a situation, it's just not really possible to create things on the scale that we are sort of looking at by yourself. And then in addition to that, I think that projects like the boats and like these other projects are also not that clear cut. But for me, because I have kind of a life as a studio artist and then I have kind of a few different other lives, also a life as a collaborative and a community-based artist, you get, the narrative becomes really complex. So you walk into the installation, you see these huge boats and okay, it's just got my name on it, but like there's really kind of a much larger story to how this came to be. Just gonna zoom around like that. Yeah, so zoom around. So take a look, he's gonna zoom around and sort of show different projects and project names. We didn't list everyone's name because it was just gonna literally be too much information, but um, but basically, you know, like whenever I give a talk, the question I always forget to answer is kind of what this night is about. Everyone always raises their hands and they go like, how did you do this? And actually Sharon, when we were setting up the installation, she would come in every day and she was like the most awesome cheerleader. And she would always say, oh my God, I can't believe what you guys are getting done. And it really sort of, sort of brought me back to that awareness of even though like the installation upstairs is my show, it really is the product of this larger creative community and that the people who lent their energies to it, it wasn't just about like pushing a paintbrush, it was like all of the kind of ingenuity and all of the like, the ways that they were involved in the Swimming Cities project and in the Mississippi project and also all of the kind of incredible um, process that goes into making the installation. And so, you know, I knew when she would say, how, did, how are you guys doing this? And I was like, oh, right, this is a special thing. It's not, it's something to be kind of explored and appreciated. Um, and so kind of as Todd was saying, you know, I, like years ago, I was a kid in school, and one of my best teachers, this woman, um, Ann Messner, said to the class, whatever you do, just find your people and stick with them. And that was like this kind of like seminal advice for me. And so I started to like kind of be inspired by a lot of activist work and a lot of different projects. And then I went to a group called the Madagascar Institute in uh, Brooklyn, and I walked in and there was this guy named Jeff Stark sitting in, a, sitting in a chair, and I was like, hey you guys, I have this idea for a project, it's gonna be this street party, and I was this total snot, and I was a little brat. And he was like, 
yeah, sure, we'll help you. And sort of in that moment, I got introduced to all of, to this kind of larger network in Brooklyn of people doing these kind of crazy, cacophonous, oftentimes illegal events. And everything built out of garbage and everything kind of unpermitted and everything just totally crazy and scrappy and pieced together. And then I kind of became introduced even to this larger historical context of like the Cacophony Society in San Francisco and the Suicide Club. And all of this history of people who had been doing these really intense kind of politically charged collaborative projects over the years. And then I started to realize that like in every city, like there's always a house that you can sort of show up at, a punk house or some kind of community space that can be like, oh, if you're going to like, if you're passing through Dallas or if you're in New Orleans, you gotta call this friend. And so over time, I sort of started to realize like how many people were sort of working in that way and just kind of tapping each other. And, and the thing that's important about this is when you look at all these different projects on here, it's like the reason that we were able to have enough ingenuity to build those rafts to go on the river is because every single person that was involved will at another time be the head of their own project or be involved in 15 other projects that they're indispensable to. Um, and in this one, I just happened to be like, hey, I have this idea, like, let's run with it, you know? But at another time, somebody will be like, oh, I really wanna make domes for Haiti, or I really wanna make this film called Fitzcard Peralta, or I really want to, you know? There's just so many different versions of events, or I wanna take these rafts down the Ganges in India, or like, whatever, you know? Everyone's always kind of poking their heads up with, with these plans and then hollering out to their friends and trying to get them together uh, to work on something. And so, um, and so that's like really kind of what we wanted to celebrate with tonight, with showing Todd's film, with just like taking a minute to really look at this, the history of all the different projects, both that the RAF project came from and which then kind of came out of the RAF project. We had actually an interesting conversation earlier about, um, Bobby mentioned Occupy Sandy, and we were like, oh, that's a huge like political movement involving like thousands of people. How can, we're not gonna stick it on here. Right, I mean, I, Bobby, when I, he wrote to me in this kind of amazing email explaining how Occupy Sandy grew up out of a very similar kind of energy, this sort of sense of empowerment and possibility. And I went to bed that night being like, no way. Mm -hmm. How can we put that on there? There's 60,000 volunteers. It's this quick, huge thing. And then I woke up in the morning and I reread it and I was like, it totally makes sense. It is the same kind of spirit in a way. Yeah. So. What, what I really loved about that story is that I feel like that there's this kind of positive feedback loop with activism and intense creative projects. And sometimes I worry that, oh, what are we doing? These kind of decadent creative things we should be doing kind of more service to the community and so on. And when I when I heard that from Bobby, I realized that you that, that one kind of nourishes the other in a pretty real way. And that like so much, like kind of so many amazing organized projects sort of inspired me to be able to call on people and work together and all of us inspired all of us to, to do stuff together. And then the kind of total the incredible like realization of possibility that happened to all of us during our time on the river was also kind of equally fed back into other projects. The other thing I don't want to forget to mention is that there's a pretty long history of people um, building boats, homemade boats in Minneapolis and going down the Mississippi. Um, and so, you know, we just kind of did it in this really loud, showy, healthy way, <laughs> but it's actually quite a long tradition. Um, and so we were really inspired by those guys as well, as well as the floating neutrinos. And um, also want to say thank you to Jeffrey Deitch. I don't know if you made it in the room yet, or you'll be here later. But um, anyway, he was a, you know, such a such a such an incredible force in New York City, and was somebody who was so supportive of us um, working on this. And also, I see Duke is here, and he may, he's maybe not on this list, Duke Riley, but he's also a huge kind of like comrade and inspiration as far as like the sort of nautical um, work. So I guess that's it. I think we should open it up to questions unless there's anything else. No, I think we can take a, you know, a couple of minutes of questions. It can be about this stuff. It can be for Callie, the, mm -hmm. the work upstairs. It can be about the film. Yeah. Um, yeah, and there are microphones on either side. Okay. Also, thanks to the Brooklyn Museum for organizing this. It was felt really important for us to be, for me to be able to speak about the larger context out of which that in, in the installation grew, and to be able to celebrate everyone whose kind of creative energies were involved. And I know we're not necessarily listing everybody's names, but just to really talk about the larger context of this creative community seemed really important. Okay, questions. And also, can you guys read what's on the screen? Is that? Okay, cool. So, yeah, you should look into some of these projects. There's really incredible 
Yeah, in fact, is, so again, oh, it's, 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 it's incomplete right now, it's a work in progress, but it is online, so you can look at the same thing online. It's just at missrockaway.org slash map. So miss, miss Rockaway, like the Rockaways, missrockaway.org slash map. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you so much for, uh, for this film. I just have a question about, not just the network, but about the kind of the distribution of molecules into the river after death, and how the kind of ecology of this work, and of, of, of Cali's work, and, and the way that sort of reuse seems to be a big part of it. I mean, is that something that um, sort of seems to happen systematically? Do you want to talk about it? I mean, in the, in the film, it, it made sense to me in a lot of different ways, like thinking about the Hudson River and spending so much time on the Hudson River at the time I was actually living in Troy, New York, on the river, basically, and sort of thinking a lot about loss and both in terms of the environment of the river and sort of personally, and so I was interested in exploring that and asking some, some of those questions, but I think it manifests in other ways in, in a lot of different projects that I guess I'll speak to the reuse bit. Um, I think that, I, you know, at the time that we started on the Rockaway, um, and I think that we were largely unsuccessful in this goal, but we really wanted to think about how we could live in a way that just had a different environmental impact. And so in our kind of like, very like, what can we do with what we can get our hands on kind of mentality, we really focused a lot on reuse and on just trying to kind of like revision how we use resources and to, and to be able to also communicate that with people as we traveled. We can take one or two more questions, um, and if you're not able to make it to the mic, Todd, if you could just repeat the question. Sure, sure, Thank sure. you. Okay. Got one? Right. And, yeah, go ahead. In the beginning of the film, the group appears to be pretty small, but arguably for seemingly fewer than 10 people. Mm -hmm. And then the film seems to leap ahead, and suddenly it's a much larger group. Yeah. 20 Was that happenstance? Like process? Don't really explain Yeah, I, I sort of just let, I decided to let that hang out there. You know? I mean, it's a movie. It's not exactly like a tight narrative, so I figured people are gonna make that leap or, or they're not. And in some way, you know, it was this idea of you know starting starting small and then expanding. You know, it was both in the in terms of focusing on sort of individuals creating their own small worlds in isolation, and then sort of having this expansion in a way. And that's both in terms of you know how people are working together, and coming together, and even just the way we shot the film. And there's a, you know in the beginning, it's everything is very close up, and then it opens in a way. But you were there, right? Yes. The question is, I'm curious. I'm sure some other folks are. How did it happen? How did, how did the group enlarge? But the, well, see, this, this, I mean, the film is, isn't actually, because it's not a documentary, you know, all of that narrative is, is narrative. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, yeah. So this, you know, you know, so this, it's, you know, the way I, Sharon said it before, but how I, you know, tend to describe it is, you know, it does document some things about this real project, but it sort of layered with fiction and mythology and oral history and all kinds of things to sort of create its own, have its own life. <laughs> okay, that's a question I think. And Blue. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a great question. Um, so I think that the, the sort of functional distinction that I tend to make is that when we come together collectively and collectively envision an idea and execute it collectively, then everyone's just in it and no one's getting paid unless somehow there were money to 
pay people in that kind of way, like stipends or something. But but on the installation, for example, if you worked on it, it you also got paid. Um, and even if you were part of the sort of, no matter what degree of sort of vested interest you had in it, it's like time and energy and people have to pay the rent. Um, and so, so for me, if it's like, if I'm thinking in that kind of single authorship kind of way, and I know that I'm going to make something which may or may not like, which can have a monetary value attached to it, then, then I, I, then monetize that. Um, and I think that, yeah, that's my sort of simple answer to that personally. And then of course there's a little sort of complicated stuff about living and traveling together and how we kind of pass the hat at shows and, and just the complicatedness of trying to imagine alternatives and kind of like you mentioned, finding yourself drawn back into systems that perhaps you wished were different. Okay, we will wrap up.